We're live. Hey there, Bob from Oregon's Constant Gardener. Welcome to the OCG Fam Show. What's going on? Any questions about nectar? Put them in the comments. We'll answer them next time. But this time, we're answering questions from last time. It's been a while, Scott. Where the hell you been? Busy. Busy. Doing Oregon's only stuff. Other things than that. Well, it's time. We should probably get caught up. It's Eric Wren. We're gonna go up. We're just gonna. We're just. We're just gonna dig through all of them. We're gonna, gonna do it. Eric Wren. Can Pegasus, Pegasus potion, be used as a foliar spray for hemp seedlings? Yep. There you go. Yep. It's great protein. It's gentle, available. Do it two to twenty times a day. If you're doing twenty times a day, you should go lighter dilution. But if you're doing like. Six times a day, you can you stick with a half a teaspoon per quart or two teaspoons per gallon. How how small a seedling? A couple leaves on there? I, five yeah, leaves I mean, really, once they're, they're sprouting, have a real true set, then feel free. Just go nuts? Yeah, I mean, you don't want to be doing 900 parts per million of Pegasus or directly uh -huh. out of the bottle, but, you know, yeah. if you're just... What do you use, like them. a little mister thing? I mean, you use sure. like as misty as it gets, and you kind of go over the top of all of them? Sure. Okay. Well, on, under, yeah. Oh, on, on, on the tray? On the underneath the leaves. You die from the top, you feed from the bottom. Well, sure, okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Just spray them. Just, all right. Yeah, it's good to use. Robert Tolotson. That sounds familiar. We've talked to him before. Hot sauce guy here. The one thing you don't discuss is the flexibility of nectar for the gods line as, um, as the plant grows. Grow. Seems most all questions time is applied to marijuana plants. I grow hot peppers and know some serious growers that use nectar for the gods for their plants too. Sadly, that never gets discussed. What we do is start from a seed indoor during winter, then spring transfer outdoors. It would be nice to see you two dive into that side, being pepper type discussion. Oh yeah, be ready Tuesday. I, I don't know what that means. I do, but we'll, I'll fill you in on that one. All right, all right. So. I, I, I had a question. I had a, a comment. failed attempt at doing a pepper show. It really, I don't know. I mean, could you, do you imagine doing a show about peppers? How would you? Well, not a whole show about yeah. peppers. I don't see where we're, I mean, you know, the downfall is not the downfall, but our, our show, our products, our industry has kind of steered us into this cannabis yeah. industry mm -hmm. more than any other, but it's amazing on the garden side how many people are using this as gardening products, what yeah. they're seeing. I mean, it's a very aggressive gardening program. People are getting a ton of food, high flavors, high bricks. You know, I, I correspond with him quite uh -huh. often online. Uh -huh. Personally, uh -huh. I have, you know, we've got Ford's Fiery Peppers, or we've yeah. got, excuse me, I got this gentleman, Dave Miner, who's apparently really well known in the hot pepper in industry. I mean, uh -huh. I've seen videos where they're all eating his peppers at trade shows, calling the, all these guys out. It's a, it's a, very much the same community as yeah. cannabis. Um, it's definitely a more focused one, a very smaller group of people. But to me, I you know, when we're talking, basically anything that applies to one plant is applies generally to. applying to the hot yeah. pepper. Everything we test these products on are tomatoes and peppers. Yeah, yeah. So the whole thing is designed around tomatoes and peppers since cannabis growing, we're not gonna yeah. risk our whole company on growing illegal plants. Sure. So we focus on peppers, tomatoes, responses, bricks, production levels, yield levels, and it's all based on hot, or, you know, peppers. Yeah. And generally hot peppers because we get so many more hot peppers than a bell pepper or sweet pepper. Um, but these guys take hot pepper growing to a level yeah. that's beyond normal. Well, you know, I, I think, you know, it naturally goes to cannabis because in your mind when you're doing something this intense, you're thinking about a high value crop. But any crop's a high value crop if you're going to eat it. Well, it should be. <laughs> you know, you know, yeah. If it's a low value crop, yeah. you probably have cancer. <laughs> but yeah. the other thing, too, is most indoor growing is focused around cannabis because that's where people did it to hide it for so many years. Sure. Like, well, I'll do it in my bedroom. Yeah. And no, the little guys of the. Yeah. yeah. And so a lot of pepper growers, they just do the one and done's outdoors. Uh -huh. Very few are doing high intense indoor. I mean, to spend that much money on lighting, environmental, uh -huh. all the, the aspects of growing sure. indoors is expensive. Pest control. <laughs> And for a pepper, it's like now your jalapenos are, you know, those are $3 a piece when you yeah. factor in all the time, money, energy, but a lot knowing of where your food's grown, knowing that's not being sprayed by something in the air, your neighbor's yeah. using Roundup, any of the other crap, there is a benefit of growing all your food indoors. Well, sure. Well, and you know, I think a lot of them too, with any crop like this, they, they're, they're slow to grow and so they start indoors. 
to well, hit the weather. I mean, if you yeah, if you want to yield, yeah, especially. See, I believe he's down in Nevada, so he's got a really amazing pepper growing environment and climate. I mean, they like hot, they like long nights, hot summer yeah, nights. Yeah, yeah. Um, we have the moisture, or we don't have the longevity, so we should be starting our tomatoes and peppers should have been started. They should be ready to go out in June and they should be plants. I mean, yeah. they should be setting fruit and developing or so we're not going to get enough off of them. But yeah, I mean, we should do more on it and we definitely, there's definitely always a parallel between what we're talking about and how plants respond, whether it's tomatoes, peppers, cannabis, hemp, doesn't matter. We test everything on peppers and uh, tomatoes, so... Yes, it works That's on kind it. of how we work on it, yeah. <laughs> and we know it works for your stuff, because he was the one that had the chocolate chip cookies. Oh, those were delicious. And the green hot sauces yeah. that we can't keep in the fridge, because huh? between me and the Amigos and Emily, they just that we consume it, so. Nice. Yeah. Well, that's pretty cool. All right. Minbo Bro Show. Question. I am doing a slurry test every three days because of low pH. Am I damaging my roots by digging that much? Also, my low pH is getting to be an issue. Three weeks now of feeding around 7.2 and still uh, uh, feeding around 7.2 and still at 6.3. Should I add lemon juice to be able to add more Ollie up? So let's take these three things. So first of all, doing a slurry test every three days, you're digging around in the dirt there. Is that a? I mean, it's yeah. I mean, every three days seems a little excessive. Yeah. And 6.3 isn't. That's okay, right? I, I would stop doing slurry tests at 6.3. You're in range. That's yeah. a good thing. Uh -huh. um, how are the plants looking? I guess email me at thebeard at organsonly.com. I want to know. I guess I would have a few more questions for this one. 6.3, I'd say you're right on point. What are the parts per million of those slurries? That might yeah. be one of the issues we're seeing. Um, you know, at 7.2 constant feeding. You're relying on that 6.3 to be your delivery because at 7.2 your calcium is still not available. I mean, you're beyond availability at 7.2. Yeah. So you might be starting to see some type of nutrient issues just because of the constant 7.2 waterings. Okay. Um, I would not add more. Um, so you are you saying that you'd want to still be even though you're pulling up. You're not gonna go to eight or seven or something. You want to still be in range so that you get some feeding to them. Because when you hit them, yeah, when you hit yeah. them that hard, you're not feeding them. You're correcting them. Uh. So at that point, you should just be watering at seven point three to with Olympus up. Yeah. Or you know, start with. So if you're just watering, yes, drop your pH with you know even lemon juice, whatever. Okay. What do you say? A lemon Sorry. juice for a pH drop. Yeah, so yeah. if you drop your lemon juice with a little lemon juice or Hades or whatever, even a little bit of her, get it down, uh -huh. add in some Olympus up, and then don't soak them, just get the top layers wet. Because oh, we want okay. that Olympus up to go in there and that non-soluble form of bicarbonate is uh -huh. going to sit there and react to the pH and buffer it back up. If you keep soaking it, it's pushing it past, past where you're even doing the testing anyway. All these teeth are driving me crazy uh -huh. today. No adhesion. I, I hate it when that happens. happens. Yeah, I feel oh. like a 90 year old woman's like, I don't eat some taffy. I don't So, so yeah, what you want to do is make sure you're only soaking. I mean, you said you're in a three gallon pot, so, you uh, know, this much of the soil, if you're watering it heavy, all that limestone it's is going below. on through. So, this isn't even oh, getting reacted. Okay. If you water just enough to soak this top layer, that limestone is going to react to that pH. Okay. Buffer it back up into the normal numbers. 6.3 is a good number unless you're seeing issues, but I'd like to get to the bottom of why we're seeing the issues. Well, he's just getting to that. So, if you were using, if you're, so if you're lowering your, or you're trying to get your pH up, you would do it with just the water and the, and the Ollie to get to, on that and Depending. then do a feeding. Well, I mean, yeah, if you're really low, yes. Yeah. If you're like 6'1 and aiming for 6'4, I would just do multiple 6'7 feeds. But still in with range. Food. In the sixes still. Yeah, because if yeah. I'm going beyond 7, I'm missing out on all my nitrogen, my phosphorus, my potassium, and we're calcium phosphate. So yeah. that phosphorus is bound to a calcium, so that 6'2 to 6'6 range is ideal. Yeah. So would you use the Herc instead of the lemon juice if available? Depends. I mean, again, if you are, because I, if I'm not trying to feed them, I'm just trying to correct the pH and I only have to bump it a little bit, then I'm putting that pH down with that Herc to uh -huh. get it low. I mean, you could, it's just, 
We're trying to fix a pH, not fix a PPM issue. Let's just work on the one thing. Yeah. With this. So, okay. And if you just didn't have lemon juice or pH down, then yeah, put some herc in, but you're probably going to have to put in a bunch of herc uh -huh. to get it to drop enough to add enough Olympus up to make a difference. So the, Olympus, the lemon juice would be preferable or the Hades down to try and use the herc. But the reaction of water. Yeah. Because yeah, if you have higher carbon of water, then that's going to also be... But then, I mean, just don't oversaturate when you're trying to correct because we're trying to correct this level. Yes, you probably could be damaging the roots if you're taking them every three days in a three gallon, three gallon pots aren't very Small, big. Yeah, so you're you taking, work with. yeah. So ideally I'd be saying have a uh, medium, like a, a bowl of soil uh -huh. that has some mycorrhiza in it. Uh -huh. Every time you take a core out, put in fresh mycorrhiza and soil into there and let that mycorrhiza kind of repair those root zones. Uh, oh, that's a good idea. But okay. yeah. Cool. But cool. email me some more info on that one. I'd like to get to the bottom of that. Yes, I'm Junior. Hey Bob, great stuff as usual. I can tell you are the type to not be happy until it's perfect. That's pretty, yeah. I would like to talk about root drenching Poseidonzyme. Thoughts, good, bad. I feel like it helped a little with a little oxidation I was getting. Cheers. So, hmm. uh, root drenching with Poseidonzyme. I don't know. What's the oxidation mean? I don't know. I mean, Poseidon root drenching is great. It's a kelp meal. It's, you know, it's rich in trace minerals. It's... We need more information. What he's asking. I want to know what I'm the oxidation doing. piece means. If it's helping with oxidation, I'd love to know what that means. But uh -huh. as far as root drenching, foliar feeding, um, liquid kelp is great at any time. It's a good potassium boost. It's good for potassium, uh, increasing your potassium numbers during the bloom stage for those who like the uh, the bump of potassium. Some people believe that that's a big yield enhancer. Um, mm -hmm. If you're using the bone meal with Poseidon, then you're getting that phosphorus potassium combo that makes for a lot of people buy PK boosters, which are really just uh, high levels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be our version of a B BK booster. PK oh, cool. booster. PK booster. But yeah, let us know what the oxidation piece means and we'll answer that one. Okay. Jason. I think it's Jason, not Jay. Jason. Son. Yeah. Um, you, he's, uh, I've used up most of my sample kit. I'm switching over to Coco, planning on running Medusa, Gaia, Herc, and Zeus. No BK at this time. If you could add one more bottle, what would it be? Athena's? <clears throat> that or Demeter. I don't so think we've done that. We have definitely, but the Demeter is if you were trying to drag more uh, magnesium out of that cocoa, in addition to other benefits well, of it. But is it, that a common thing, I guess is what I'm asking with the magnesium? It's a perception, it seems like. Well, no, I mean, these plants are hungry for it. Yeah. And most people over, well, not most people, a lot of people will overdo it with the idea that this is what the industry has told us. That's what I'm getting yeah. at. But yeah. Demeter's is also, calcium is a far more important building block of the cell than amino. I mean, they're both very important, but sure. calcium will bring in the aminos and there's aminos in Medusa. There's aminos in yeah. just from all the materials we use, uh -huh. all the you know meals we use, there's natural amino acids that are occurring. The soil will have natural amino acids as well. So if I had to pick one, I would say Demeter's before Athena's. Okay. Then I'd run Athena's. But not about the, the magnesium issue, just about the other calcium no, and stuff in well, there. And, it's the broad spectrum of yeah. I'm trying to get more stuff yeah. to chelate from the medium itself. Sure. So I'm using multiple forms of calcium ah. to do the chelation. Not whether it's potassium, magnesium, whatever. We're just giving more ammo to chelate more from the soil. Is there anything else in the conversation, Aphrodite? Uh, no. Uh, not Greek. if not if you're going with Spartan to go yeah. to Greek. No, Demeter's I mean, probably follow it. that row, and then you know after that, Athena's. Then we're going into the Aphrodite's, possibly Kraken, possibly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Uh, Tony Polanskis. Hey Scott, I'm using Advanced Nectar Schedule with BK. I am soil drenching only. My one strain is stretching, and doing too well. My question is, will the stretching continue even after the three-week stretch using BK? Excessive height will be a problem in my tent. It usually calms down. Depending on genetics, it should calm down. Okay. Because it's usually a you know, precursor to when plants hit that 24 down to 18 or 12 hours, uh -huh. they tend to want to stretch out to that light because they've, their light has reduced. Uh -huh. Okay. Watering it in, that's how, you know, we've talked about this on episodes past that, you know, if you're foliar feeding chaos, it promotes stocky yeah. internodal spacing and branching. Uh -huh. If you're water drenching it, it promotes elongation and growth. So if you're in veg and you want them to grow fast and tall, you water it in, you don't spray it. 
If yeah. you want to create a lot of flower sites and create a smaller canopy, then you foliar feed and then wait till bloom to start watering it in. He sounds like he's been watering it in. Uh huh. Yeah. I'd be if they're getting too big, I'd stop watering it in. Right. Turn your lights, or if your lights already switched and you've reached the height you like, then stop watering it in. Wait for them to actually set fruit and then start watering it back in when the fruit is. Because whatever stage they're in, they're going to promote more of that stage. More of that stage. So okay. if they're in the stretch stage, they're going to stretch more than you want them to. If they're in the production stage, they're going to produce more than you want them to. No such thing. So why do the, the plants stretch? I mean, are they literally going to the light or is this like, I mean, is that a genetic Survival. thing about them? They're, they're trying to get out of the grass well, you know, if out I, in the wild. If you had a bunch of food here and yeah. you just fall your face <laughs> into an eat and then I take the food and I move it over there, I'll you're going to get up there. and go get it. Uh -huh. So light is it's the food, food. And yeah. if the light goes up, the light starts diminishing in length, then the plants want to find it and go get uh -huh. it. So often the stretch is just, they're surviving and trying to get more energy. Keith McGreeny, thanks for answering my previous question. Now, one more. I am using a scrog system and need to train the branches on the grid. Should I hold off on the kraken until the grid is fully weaved to avoid branches that might snap? Say, until the stretch in early flower. I would stop foliar feeding. Watering it in, I have no problem. That okay. doesn't do the same hardening off as a watering as it does as a foliar. So when you're foliar feeding it, it tends to really make those rigid branches. As a watering, it's just promoting the plant health. Yeah. So I wouldn't worry about it. If you still want to use the Kraken, feel free to continue watering it in. Uh -huh. Once they get and you've woven them into shape, then you can feel free to start foliar feeding them daily to get them to kind of take that rigidity and then stay in that spot. Okay. okay. So it helps them strengthen up and hold the weight too. Of you know, when it starts producing fruit, it'll hold the weight better. And that goes for pepper guys too. Seriously, with all uh, the peppers start producing. Oh yeah. And you're putting in the uh, cracking into the soil. Once they set and you got this weight in there, and you see the flower production foliar feeding, that will help those branches hold up the weight of the pepper better. Tomatoes, peppers, watermelons. Tomatoes, probably even more so. That was where you run tomatoes into issues are, the fatties. Yeah, but they're a vine already, so yeah, they're a nightmare. You better have a cage around a tomato. <laughs> Nothing that kite or uh, cracking will do that will actually harden it up, make harden, it a yeah, plant. You don't want it. It's not going to get woody. woody <laughs> tomato stem. They're gross. All right. Uh, Robert Scott Nicky. Hey, Bob. I'm the in the first week of veg. And my soil is at pH of 6.4 and my PPM is at 300. I'm using nectar number four soil and following the comprehensive feeding regimen. So that's everything in the Greek, but no, uh, no BK. Uh, just wondering if those numbers are good uh, for, uh, are good for feeding at 1300 PPMs. So I guess he means his mixture is 1300. I would imagine. Yeah. As long as they know, which is, what was your last mixture feeding? Was it 1200? Then you're fine. If you were at 400 going to 1300, it probably wouldn't. Makes sense. But right. it sounds like if you're normally been That's feeding, what he's just been doing. Yeah, like, yeah. No, I mean, if your plants look healthy, the one thing we found is we don't we don't drive by a P, We get it all the time. What PPM should I be running your nutrients at? I, what are you growing? What's yeah. your environment? What's your HVAC? What's your lighting situation? How high are your lights? How low are you? Know, uh -huh. There's no answer to this other than I like to start everything at half strength, slowly uh -huh. increase it throughout the schedule, mm. document everything I'm doing, input, slurries, uh -huh. all of it, and then you find out, wow, this genetic can handle pushing at this level this many times a week, and I get this yield. So, But if I handed that to you and you're growing this other yeah. genetic, totally. this burned the crap out of my plants at this level, so I had to back it off to half, and they still yielded this. I still got this quality. So it really depends on can you get to that. I got guys who can hit 2,500 parts per million every other day, no problem, because they've gotten their plants to get to that point of feeding. But everything with this line, you have to kind of acclimate them in slowly. Uh -huh. So start at two, 400 parts per million and slowly go to five, six, eight, 12, 13, 18. So there is no absolute answer, no. but is that a... Uh, a valid that's normal but that's a process to, to monitor your ppms of your new well, mixture yeah that's a good question because what i would do now so in about two weeks i'll be at you know he's at 13 to 1500 parts per million uh -huh. in a couple weeks i'd go back and i'd check my slurry right before i'm about to go into bloom or right before i'm in the third week yeah. of bloom and say all right well two days ago i did 1500 i did a slurry and it's at 320 man they love what i'm giving them sure so I might go up to 1650 
and see what a happens. little another bump and then in another two three weeks do another test if it's still uh-huh. at that 250 to 350 range they're eating what i'm giving them so i can keep raising them up now if you went to 1300 for three feedings and in two weeks you do the ppm test and it came back at 600 no they they're not accepting everything you're giving yeah. them so now you want to do a flush recalculate your nutrient schedule and kind of back off a few things because now you're just wasting food if they're not accepting it so i use the slurry and my input to gauge and there's a, there's a question coming up that's going to kind of go okay. over the same yeah. thing but um if i know i'm going in at 1500 and i'm always coming out of my slurry at 250 to 350 i know that they like that recipe if i go to 1800 and this goes to 600 then i've given them too much they're not accepting it all so now i want to back everything back because if you start overfeeding the plant just stops accepting everything and starts just focusing on a few things and then you get these imbalances and deficiencies okay they start going for the easier meal and then you start to see the plant starting to struggle because they're lacking potassium they're lacking calcium they're lacking something because uh-huh. they're accessing this and so something's building up because they're only accessing one thing if i can even that playing field reduce what i gave them too much of then they start accepting everything again and maintaining that 250 to 350 range Okay, I want to ask a, a real basic question. So I got, I've got my two teaspoons of this, my four teaspoons of this. I'm doing my whole thing. I put that in there. I mix. I measure that up. I'm at like twelve hundred, mm-hmm. and I want to be at fifteen hundred. I'm not going to change today, right? I'm going to next time. I'm going to put half a teaspoon See, of at that point. In. I'll just say, like if I want to be at fifteen hundred, yeah. and my mindset going into the garden that day was like I need to be at fifteen hundred today, yeah. and I measured it at twelve. Yeah. Then I'll bump up. The main things I'm doing. So if I'm in uh-huh. veg, I'm going to bump up a little Medusa. I'm okay. Bump up a little bit of Demeters. I might bump up a little bit of something. If I'm in Bloom, I'm going to bump up Herc. I'm going to bump up Afro. I'm going to bump up Persephone. Okay. To get me to those 15, I'm going to guide my recipe to what the stage I'm doing. Okay. And I, I'm not going to be messing things up with my pH level by doing but these in after. No, that. I mean you don't want to sit there and do 42 adjustments because yeah. now you're just playing chemistry. Sure. But if yeah. you just are bump, like I'm going to drop in another two tablespoons because I know roughly this adds 200 parts per million a tablespoon, yeah. which is, no, that's not a yeah, calculation. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, as a reference, and then just knowing that bam, I hit that, I'm not going to go up and down on my pH 30 times to get it to be perfect. Now, I'm doing this all before I did my pH, so is my um, Olympus up going to change my PPMs? It can, depending on your water. Your Again, I mean, it's Experience not across the board. Yeah. Because okay. I have guys that when they add it, they hit a point of diminishing, it's like a diminishing return. I got Got to keep adding it. It's not increasing anymore. Oh, so okay. ideally, for most people, that's never going to be an issue. Right. I have a handful of gardeners that, I mean, we it is battle. Good. And, and yeah. we don't, I mean, it's chemistry. We cannot figure out what's in their water without doing a full lab. Like, yeah. what is in your water that is going, one teaspoon takes you up a point. Two teaspoons take you up two points. Uh-huh. Three teaspoons takes you up two and a quarter points. Okay, yeah. now where did this fall apart? And is it a saturation issue? Is it a, you know, something in your water is saturated with the limestone that we're putting in? There's something going on. And at that point, it's like, that's a tough one. Yeah, okay. Just almost unsolvable. Well, it's one that we're yeah. know, five years later still scratching yeah. it because we don't have that problem here. If I had yeah. a teaspoon, I'm substantially going up. Yeah, yeah. You, every you now. Up, and it's up, not up. one point, one point. I mean, no, there is a point but, where it starts to wane, but it's yeah. like, I can well, get up to 12. I mean, I can turn my solution into a 10 pH yeah. solution pretty fast. But you'll you'll never get to 50 because there, there is no 50. It's you know, impossible. There's been a, it gets well, tighter as you go. 12. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. as you get closer and closer, more, yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, Roberto Alvarez. Is that the... Oh, <laughs> question. If my nutrients of nectar for the gods start having a bad smell, it's not like really bad. It will get really bad. It, <laughs> is it still good to use? It is. So it's it was really bad when we made it. The day we make nectar, anything generally, uh-huh. anything we make smells horribly dead when we make it. Because that's exactly well, what because it's horribly dead. dead. Yes. Which is good because if it was horribly alive, then we'd have to horribly kill it, and then we'd have to horribly digest it, and that's horrible. So. So let me it ask. Just stinks. When does it go bad? I mean, it, 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 well, how do you know if it's going bad? The I mean. Even swelling doesn't dictate bad in our, uh-huh. our world, so uh-huh. I don't even go with that. But if it's starting to swell, then it's starting to break down. The proteins are starting to ferment or gas off and uh-huh. creating CO2. So usually that's the first sign that it's spoiling. Okay. 
Um, generally, with our spoiling, something got in or air started reacting. Something is creating a pH shift to the uh -huh. up. When the pH starts uh -huh. climbing in the concentrate, then it's going to spoil. And, then, and really, other than that, I mean, it's pretty well preserved in this bottle. Yeah. And the only thing, contamination and air are the only things that really make it go bad. So what does spoiled mean, though? I mean, is it, it doesn't work anymore? No, it's I mean, not going to hurt. Compost me. is spoiled. Yeah. So yeah. it, it won't hurt anything. It's just offensive. Yeah. I mean, there's, it, you open it up and your far. whole house smells like dead. <laughs> and then that part's no. rough. Yeah. Um, uh, and if it smells like alcohol, like if you smell methane and alcohol smell, then yeah. it's definitely turned and it is actually fermented. It's brown the bend. <laughs> and, you know, at that point, I would just water the lawn with it, a flower garden, a bush. Uh -huh. I mean, it's still usable. I yeah. just wouldn't put it in a three-gallon pot. So it's really hard to go bad, bad. And when yeah. you... Open up a bottle that hasn't been used in six months, and there's a film of nice hyphy and life. That's not bad either. Yeah. That's literally life that has lived on top of the surface of this concentrated nutrient. You could even scratch that into your soil surface if you want. I wouldn't. I'd put it in my compost bin uh -huh. or out in a giant flower bar yeah. garden. Um, but it's not gone bad. Okay. If you have like weird colored rainbow molds, then you probably are growing like weird death penicillins and it stuff. It could be the UFOs. Could be. Yep. All right. Put your tin hat on and go to bed. <laughs> ah, pancakes. Pancakes are good. When you're feeling like the UFOs are coming after you, have some pancakes. You feel better. Tin foil hat, pancakes. You're okay. Just a little tip. Yeah, I've never heard that one. <laughs> Try it. Pancakes. Pancakes. Eh? Yep. You have some pancakes. You're gonna feel better. Sweet. Uh, Michael Palacios. How much will Herculean harvest and bloom chaos? Raise pH. I test the pH with the solution and vial because I don't trust the pens. My issue is after I add the bloom chaos, it tints the watercolor to make the pH difficult the way I'm doing it. I should invest in a good digimeter. I know I am using Herculean Harvest and bloom chaos. Thank you, Mike. So now he's putting, he sounds like he's putting it in a vial and then putting this. Well, he's got one of those general hydro. Oh, pH. one of those things. So yeah. he's not using the little. Because I just take the, the dip the paper in yeah. the thing. If you well, that's what I I mean. Get some litmus paper. Don't do the drop test. The drop test, the humic acid and the kelp in the chaos and the Zeus and the Poseidon will mm -hmm. all turn your solution dark, mm -hmm. which then will raise the pH in your solution color. But your pH has not risen. Your uh, pH okay. because of the Herculean chaos does not bring Hercules up at all. So. Um, I would get litmus paper and check that pH and then, okay. you know, for a good pH pen, the one, I mean, get a good blue lab or a yeah. good Hannah or something. Uh -huh. Stay away from the $30 tester kits or the pH check ones, you know, anything that's like affordable, don't buy it because yeah. it's affordable, yeah. it's not going to work. Yeah. But pH. You'll have your problems with the blue lab, but still it's a pretty good meter. Right, you call you know? them and they'll yeah. work with you yeah. where most yeah. of these other guys are like, send it in, we'll give it back to you like Kubota Tractor does in six weeks, maybe <laughs> we'll call you maybe. then. And we'll let you know. Thanks Kubota. Anyway, um, get litmus paper because I, I'm, mm. I'm a little nervous for you right now because if you are treating it like Herculean and chaos is taking your pH up, it's not. It's not. It's going down the other way. Yeah. You're going to be too low for both of them to be available. You might soak in some some holly into the old soil there, maybe. Just get the paper. Get the paper. Yep. Yeah. And. Yeah, and the downfalls, we get this a lot with the drop tests. They're great for three parts, you know, the GH, yeah. the botanic uh -huh. the whatever's. The purple stuff. Anything. Yep. Um, but because they don't, when you add the little bits into their solution of those salts, then it doesn't change the color of the solution much. Right. So yeah. you can actually test that and get an actual color bar. Our stuff will ruin the color bar and make it all dark. Oh. So it makes everything look yellow, I believe, and that's what raises the pH. But ah, it's not yeah, raising it's like your pH, so you're watering too low. Hopefully you're veg and it's not an issue. We'll find out. Mm -hmm. Mike Keefe. This is a long one. Are you ready? I have already been using nectar, newts, and soils, but have never done PPM testing, just pH. And up until now, I have had excellent success, but now I got a PPM meter and I was looking into testing my soil. My question is this, because this is not a salt-based nutrient program, how do I know if the soil I'm testing is going to test properly when organic materials generally don't run all the salts which give the electrical conductivity? According to my searching, um, because, oh, according to my searching, 
and how to even and use how to this even truncheon. use this truncheon meter. It's not a blue lab, just a middle of the road tester. They all say testing organic mediums can give the the wall results off the wall. Off the wall, you should be reading, not me. Raw results because. I think my eyes are going back. Well, because I can old. read it from back here, but if I was a sitting <laughs> close to you, I wouldn't be able to read it either. <laughs> can give off, off the wall results because of the NPK base. Um, is it okay to just grow this without doing that? I've never tested the PPMs, and I've always turned out fantastic product from just using the Nectar line. I'm only feeding a quarter of a gallon every two days in five gallon air pots, and they always seem to respond absolutely perfectly per to this nutrition, nutrition line. line. I think he's doing this on the phone. I have all the products to do the full Roman regimen, which I fed full strength just to see what it would do according to uh, according to the PPM meter and how effectively to test the soil and water now, solution. According to the chart, and it actually turned out perfect weed without having to mess with it. So I'm kind of reluctant to start dinking around with it not being really well versed in PPMs and how to effectively test the soil and water solution for PPMs. Do you have a beginner's methodology on how to do the EC testing steps? I don't find much that's helped me. <laughs> I just wanted this to even be better than, okay, so basically there's no link. The downfalls, our nutrient line is different. You are right. Yeah. It does not, you know, with a lot of people, a lot of nutrient lines will run off of a PPM or an EC. You know, if you're running our line, this is this is your parameters for PPMs and EC. Yeah, it's like instructions for putting an IKEA table together, you're, which it should yeah, be, because yeah. you know the difference of 900 and 1400 in a pure synthetic line is death. Yeah, especially if you're in a hydroponic table, you're feeding four times a day at 15 minute intervals every hour. You know, it's you yeah, start to um, overfeed really fast. So yeah. PPMs are so critical in a lot of lines. Yeah. We use PPM meters and TDS meters and EC meters, however you want to measure it. Uh -huh. That's what we're doing. We're measuring a reference point. We're not trying to say you should be at 900 parts per million by week five of bloom with every single plant grown on the planet because that's ridiculous. What we're saying yeah. is it's nice to measure that your plant in your garden, in uh -huh. your environment, that in veg, you got them to 500 parts per million and everything was awesome. And the slurries that you took mm -hmm. at the end of that were at 300 parts per million. So they would loved everything you gave them. Mm -hmm. When you got into bloom, you started increasing and you're using that truncheon, which isn't really a middle of the line. You bought a nice truncheon. Yeah. Those are great tools. Mm -hmm. I love them. Uh, they're super easy to use and they definitely just they're works. a reference. You yeah. put it in, it gives you the number, you're good. Uh -huh. Easy to clean, easy to, anyway, back to reality. Yeah. So when you are using it as a reference, you're kind of just monitoring and it doesn't matter. There's no science on this level. It's yeah. not reading the organics. It's not reading the salts in the soil. It's not reading everything the same way it would a synthetic line, but it is reading a real Something number a real, that is referencing the real number you're putting in. Yeah. So if you're watering at 1200 and going back to the earlier in this video, uh -huh. you're at 12 here and it's at 250 to 350 here, uh -huh. you're feeding them and they're loving it. If you're at 1600 and this goes to 600 to 800, then they're not taking it all. So don't waste your food and back it off. Mm. Use your truncheon strictly as a reference piece. So it's, the, it's more the movement of the number than what the absolute number is. There is no absolute number. Yeah. We have guys literally that push over 2,500 parts per million. If you did that today, your stuff would burn up tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's too much nutrition. But if you go 200, 300, 500, 700, 800, 950, 2,000, yeah. you can slowly get them up to there where they're eating more than you can want to give them yeah. and then see what your yield does. Not everybody wants to do that. It's expensive. It's tedious. It's I mean, it's sometimes mind-boggling, yeah. like, oh my gosh, these plants. <laughs> you know, that's it. It's Frank, we gave him his four last year. Uh -huh. And he was up to like 2,800 parts a million because he has no concept of like, that stuff's going to taste terrible. <laughs> but he doesn't care. He's just like, oh, look at how much these plants eat from doing it. Just like, yeah, well, I don't want that. You need to go ahead and put that in the compost. Just call it a Seymour. <laughs> so there is a, there's a, and you know, to me, it's kind of fun to see at what point, is there a diminishing return on the inputs? Uh -huh. You know, because what's the point of putting in 2,400 parts per million if you're only going to get two pounds of light? Yeah. Or, you know, if I can get that with 1,200 parts per million, I'm saving a lot of nutrition by not overdoing yeah. it the whole time. And a lot of risk that you would have had of it and work that you would have done to do all of that. Yeah. yeah. 
So really use it as a reference. It's a great tool to have. It's gonna be the first thing everybody ever asks you if you have a problem in your garden is what's your uh -huh. slurry numbers uh -huh. because we wanna know that one to one, uh -huh. what's the pH and PPMs. Yeah. And that is a very, because you know, somebody else had asked, what is this even measuring in the soil when you're doing these TDS or these, you know, yeah, because yeah, yeah. it's all, everything on the planet is made of salts, acids, and amino acids. So yeah. here's the reality. As things break down, you have a salt that becomes yeah, available. Yeah. Cocoa fiber breaks down into a salt and aminos. Everything's breaking down into an element. So as microbes are digesting all that food that you put in, all the organic acids we put in and everything that's built into the soil, those microbes are making that salt available. That salt becomes available in the soil sure. to where you actually have a readable number. You're reading what has been digested and is made available. If that starts getting too high, the plants can't access it evenly, so they just get lazy and start taking in the simplest meal and they stop eating potassium. They stop eating or uptaking potassium, calcium, you know. Things start to get pushed to the side to take the easier food. So that's the issue when there's too much there is that they get the easy stuff and the hard stuff. And so we're not trying to starve them, but we're trying to give them just enough so that they'll eat healthy. If you were 400 pounds, like last that month, <laughs> before the fat and camp. we put a giant bowl of pudding right here, yeah. uh -huh. and then we put a bowl of soup right here, I'm gonna eat the and then pudding. we put a salad over there I'm next to that, that cow that you oh, have to... too far. Yeah, so yeah. you're just going to keep taking in the fat stuff because it's easy yeah. and you don't uh -huh. have to get up and do anything. So plants, although they are incredibly vigorous, they're very responsive, once you overload them with lazy they take the easy, lazy meal. Uh -huh. The path of least resistance is, sure. I'm gonna take that salt, it's got yeah. the mineral content, it takes the water in and out. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love salt. Yeah. So get rid of the salt and then you can start ramping up your nutrition. Okay. I think that's, that's a show. That is, however, back to Tilston. Tilston. Robert Tillotson? Tillotson. Yeah. So he sent us something. He said, oh, whoa! For Tuesday. For Tuesday. Which we're a day off, yeah. or a few. Okay. I was out of town. I went to uh, a special event with my son, so we weren't here for last week's show. So he sent us something. What's that on top of it? It looks like a good sale, four for one. This is a newspaper. I've heard about these. Yeah, rallies, rallies in Bel Air. Oh my God, I see her. That's yeah, some corn. Yeah, corn. Yeah, corn. Yeah, Rosita's Rose five there. for five. A dollar oh, cans of beans tacos. down there. Oh, they got wine, thirty percent. They got tamales, two forty nine. Oh, but na 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 na. Pork loin, baby back ribs. Hell yeah. Got two pounds these. for five dollars. Some wine here. You drink much wine? No, don't drink. Mm. Well, I don't drink wine either. It's very rare. If you see me drinking, then you might want to just hang around because <laughs> it's going to get pretty interesting. <laughs> so I'm really good at it. Cool. So he makes this stuff. Remember? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's delicious. This stuff. Good stuff. <laughs> it is such good stuff. And he makes these. What are these? Cookies. Well, I know they're cookies. They're not green cookies. Okay. They're fun cookies. Fun cookies. Oh my gosh, you like way overdid it, dude. That's incredible. I right, get these Whoa. into the ah, buddy. Get on some eggs. We're never upset when people send us food products on the show or it's at amazing. Oregon's only. That's at 3661 Olympic Street, Springfield, Oregon 97478. Send food, nothing green. I don't need the green. Don't just show up. We just do the keys. You can show up, but that wouldn't. <laughs> it won't go well. You might want to call ahead. <laughs> we have We're a an open carry state. Draconian <laughs> security measures may be taken. Yeah. Frank does patrol the property. <laughs> and he's not the homeless guy in the corner. No. All right, we're supposed to eat one of these. All right. I hope I don't die. You're not going to die. Wow. You're probably going to shit your pants, but not die. Mm. Man, you want all of them. What do you mean I want all of them? You got a oh. big one. I don't know, man. It's hot. It's not hot. Yes, it is. See? It's so good. I can't believe... Is it that hot?
It's not that hot. It's good though. Is it like all the? <laughs> I can feel it in my ear. Really? Yes. The flavor is so good that it just keeps climbing. It's hot. <laughs> There's no. <laughs> Um, they suck because they're making my mouth water so bad my teeth are staying. <laughs> oh, you know, Bob. <laughs> you know I'm a hypochondriac. I'm feeling like I'm gonna suffocate or something. Oh, no, not at all. No, you're not. You're not breathing funny. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh, that is so good. Did I tell you I took these around to all the Amigos and they wouldn't eat them? No, they're smart! No, they're Amigos. They should be eating this stuff. They these don't like good. hot stuff. They're pretty Is good. it calming down now? It's calming down a little. It's amazing how it comes and just climbs and then goes right back down. It hasn't gone right back down. <laughs> <laughs> My tongue burns. It's probably swelling up. I'm probably going to choke on it here in a minute. I think I might make a provisional 911 call. We're close. <laughs> we love driving our factory here. just for that reason alone. <laughs> yeah, these are good hot though. Holy crap! It is good. I okay, these these are definitely hotter than the last batch. Oh yeah. I mean, and they have way more holding power. They, I mean, this could get rid of a cold. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I'm gonna go down and see who's you sick. You <laughs> I gotta have got one of these. For you. This will cure you or kill you. My <laughs> only complaint is they make my mouth water so much that my denture keeps falling out, so it's making it really hard to eat them. But good cookie. He's gonna like this episode. He's been bugging me all week. So did you open it yet? <laughs> have you, has Bob tried them yet? Make sure go tell him just to. I was giving me a door at the beginning. Oh, this see. is the second question right here. That I was, was like, man, yeah. if we do this right now, that would ruin the whole show. Ruin Bob's going to sit over here too. Did you ever that. see when we did the, the Hot Wings show? Me and Ford? And, and, oh my God, that was a nightmare. Oh my. It's good stuff. And I think I think we diminishing returns on the show though. I don't know. I think that, that you watch. You may even want to start this off by... Stick around to the end while you watch me die. Because <laughs> I think you were about ready to start crying. Yeah, yeah, maybe we'll try a whole cookie next time. That's the show. We do it right now. No, no. Take a pull. No. Get a body. Get a body. I love you. Happy I'll Friday. See you next time. <laughs>